Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And in our ongoing series on Nobel Prize winners, tonight we're going to talk about Sidney Brenner, who died recently at the age of 92. He can reasonably be called one of the great scientists of the 20th century. And we've actually talked about Sidney Brenner before because he was one of the three people awarded the 2002 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, along with John Sulston, whose podcast we've done, and Robert Horvitz of Niles East High School, later of MIT. They were awarded the Nobel Prize for their discoveries concerning genetic regulation of organ development and programmed cell death. According to the NobelPrize.org website, the human body consists of hundreds of cell types, all originating from the fertilized egg. During the embryonic and fetal periods, the number of cells increased dramatically. The cells mature and become specialized to form the various tissues and organs of the body. Large numbers of cells are formed also in the adult body. In parallel with this generation of new cells, cell death is a normal process both in the fetus and adult to maintain the appropriate number of cells in the tissues. This delicate controlled elimination of cells is called programmed cell death. This year's Nobel laureates in physiology or medicine have made seminal discoveries concerning the genetic regulation of organ development and programmed cell death. By establishing and using the nematode C. elegans, as an experimental model system, possibilities were opened up to follow cell division and differentiation from the fertilized egg to the adult. The laureates have identified key genes regulating organ development and programmed cell death and have shown that corresponding genes exist in higher species, including man. The discoveries are important for medical research and have shed new light on the pathogenesis of many diseases. Sidney Brenner established C. elegans as a novel experimental model organism. This provided a unique opportunity to link genetic analysis to cell division, differentiation, and organ development, and to follow these processes under the microscope. Brenner's discoveries carried out in Cambridge, UK, laid the foundation for this year's prize. He realized that in the early 1960s, fundamental questions regarding cell differentiation and organ development were hard to tackle in higher animals. Therefore, a genetically amenable and multicellular model organism simpler than mammals was required. The ideal solution proved to be the nematode C. elegans. This worm, approximately one millimeter long, has a short generation time and is transparent, which made it possible to follow cell division directly under the microscope. Brenner provided the basis in a publication from 1974 in which he broke new ground by demonstrating that specific gene mutations could be induced by the chemical compound ethyl methane sulfonate. Different mutations could be linked to specific genes and to specific effects on organ development. This combination of genetic analysis and visualization of cell divisions observed under the microscope initiated the discoveries that are awarded this year's Nobel Prize. Here's the BBC reporting on the 2002 Nobel Prize award to Sidney Brenner. In the autumn of 2002, the winners of that year's Nobel Prizes assembled before the Swedish royal family to the accompaniment of a Mozart march. When the ceremony got to the prize for physiology or medicine, the sound of trumpets rang out and the name of Sidney Brenner was called. Dr. Sidney Brenner receives his medal and diploma from His Majesty the King of Sweden. Sidney Brenner was a nice Jewish boy from Germiston, South Africa, right near Johannesburg. His parents were immigrants from Eastern Europe and he was largely self-taught. He learned to read from the newspapers that were placed on the family dining table and from the local library. And by the time he was 15, he was eligible to go to university. He was admitted to read medicine at the University of Witwatersrand when he was 15 years old. Interestingly enough, in his class was another nice Jewish boy who was 15 years old, also South African, Aaron Klug, whose podcast we've done, who was awarded the 1982 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Those two became fast friends even as they went their separate ways when they went to Great Britain. And in fact, they even co-authored a paper together with Francis Crick at one point, one of the only times that three Nobel Prize winners co-authored the same paper. Brenner was too young to study medicine, so he took a master's degree and he found himself in Great Britain. And this is where his story gets really interesting. Even though he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work with C. elegans in the 1970s, that was probably not his most important work. He was a crucial figure in the 1950s in advancing the new field of molecular biology. And you could make an argument he should have won a Nobel Prize for that. In fact, he often said his major role 
in winning the Nobel Prize was simply picking the right organism to make it easy to study the gene structure. And rather than rehash that work, I refer you to the John Sulston podcast. Brenner's work in the 1950s studying the structure and function of the gene should have won him the Nobel Prize and was arguably his more important work. Without that, his later work would not have been possible. It started with one of the most important discoveries of the 20th century, the double helix stranding of DNA by James Watson and Francis Crick. And Sidney Brenner was one of the first people invited to see that. Here's the BBC describing Sidney Brenner's role in the founding of the science of molecular genetics and molecular biology. Sidney was privy to one of the greatest scientific discoveries of the 20th century, the double helix structure of DNA. DNA was known to be the stuff that genes are made of, but it remained unclear how genes copy themselves, and above all, how they produce proteins the complex molecules that form cells and bodies and which make them work, hormones, enzymes and so on. To answer these questions, researchers focused on describing the structure of the DNA molecule. The big breakthrough came in 1953 when Jim Watson and Francis Crick at Cambridge, using crystallographic data from Rosalind Franklin at King's College London, explained how two spiralling DNA molecules could bind together in a double helix using the four component chemical bases of DNA, which are known by their initials A, C, T and G. In a BBC broadcast in the 1980s, Crick and Watson recalled their excitement when they realised that the double helix explained how DNA could copy itself. Suddenly I could put together A and T and G and C. Could hardly believe it. And Francis came in almost immediately and saw this. And he, you remember, something came out of the model building that Jim had done, which he hadn't put in. And that's always the sign that you feel you're on the right lines. When something begins to click, but even more important, Francis, by using these rules A and T and G and C, we understood how the molecule replicated. That's so right. Everything from then on was clear. Everything was finished except the hard work. That's to say, producing an accurate model. It struck us with a tremendous impact. Just how beautiful and exciting it was. Because there before us was the answer to one of the fundamental problems in biology, how do genes replicate? And it was very simple, and you couldn't miss it. Sidney Brenner, along with some of his colleagues from Oxford, was invited to see the double helix model even before it had been published. We went over that day, and that's where I met Francis and Jim. So this is to see the, the famous yeah, model was, that they had made. It was in April. The moment I saw that, then I said, well, that's it. Now, let's get on with it. So I started the following day to think about the code. His response to the beauty of the double helix showed how sharp Sidney's mind was. The key question now was how did the DNA in the gene enable the cell to produce a protein? A few years later, Sidney summed up the problem in a rather straight-laced talk he gave on the BBC. On the one hand, we have the gene, DNA, a linear message inscribed in a four-symbol language. On the other hand, we have the protein chain, a linear structure built out of 20 different amino acids. What could be neater than the idea that there is some simple relation between the two, that the sequence in a gene determines the sequence in a protein chain. This is the central idea of molecular biology. At that point, he began a 20-year partnership with Francis Crick, and in 1961, Crick, Brenner, and their assistants were the first to prove that the code for each of the 20 amino acids was a sequence of three bases, known as the triplet codon. That same year, working with French biologist Francois Jacob and the U.S. geneticist Matthew Messelson, Brenner proved the existence of a messenger, a short-lived RNA transcript of the DNA sequence that directs the cell's production of amino acids. Armed with these two concepts, the triplet code and the messenger, molecular biologists around the world could begin to complete the molecular puzzle of linking each DNA or RNA triplet to a specific amino acid or stop signal. This also confirmed the long-held but never proven belief that it was the DNA code that created protein structure 
and not the other way around. Here, Dr. Brenner outlines the essential questions they were faced with in the 1950s about molecular biology. See, everybody knew that enzymes were functional things and they had a complex structure. And everybody knew that they'd have to, how the polypeptide chain was determined. And then people actually thought there were separate genes for folding of proteins. And there was separate machinery to do this. And Francis's uh, real uh, basic simplification was that there were two sequences, a one-dimensional sequence on the nucleic acid, which specified a one-dimensional sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain. And that one-dimensional sequence of amino acids in the polypeptide chain in turn specified how the protein folded up. And that's the fundamental thing. And that really crystallized all the problems and all the issues into the following questions. How does the DNA structure map onto the amino acid sequence? That is, what is the genetic code? Of course, there's a subsidiary question, which is what is the mechanism of protein synthesis? But we could formulate an abstract question. What is the nature of the genetic code? And of course, what the theoreticians wanted to do is solve it without hands. And the other question was to understand the folding of these polypeptide chains into proteins. That lays the, the groundwork for molecular biology. Francis, that he mentioned there was Francis Crick, and here he talks about the genius of Francis Crick, who, as I said, he worked with for 20 years. And, of course, one of the other things that I learned uh, through these interactions was to get the scale of everything right. It's very important. This is not done. You know, you can tell by the drawings. For example, you know, very early on we realized that the amount of DNA in a bacterium, it's one millimeter, and it's in a bacterium that's one micron. So the DNA has to be folded up a thousand times. And the pictures that you see of a bacterium with a little circle in it are ridiculous. Furthermore, when you think that most of the bacterium is full of these ribosomes, and that the correct picture is not that ribosomes move along the messenger, but the messengers, because the ribosomes are big, their diffusion is quite slow, but the messengers must be moving through the cell like a lot of uh, hysterical snakes threading their way through the ribosomes like this. And I've always thought that it is very good to try to get that picture over. And I feel there's not enough done about this. People don't teach themselves scales of anything and how molecules reach things and so on. And for instance, that's one of the things that we tried very hard to do was to stay imprisoned within the physical context of everything. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. As I said, Sidney Brenner, working with Francis Crick, discovered the significance of codons, a set of three bases or letters in the DNA sequence that signify the correct string of amino acids that ribosomes use to assemble proteins. Here he talks about the excitement of the discovery when he and Francis Crick were the only two people in the world who realized what the importance of that was. When we knew there was a triplet code, we could sit in the lab and say, the only people in the world that knows this to be a fact. Well, Sidney Brother was a heavy smoker for most of his life. In his later years, he was tethered to an oxygen tank. He moved to La Jolla and settled at the Scripps Institute for a while for his health. But ultimately, he lived out his years in Singapore, where he worked on a number of projects to advance science in that country. So he certainly had a long travel in his lifetime. A child of Eastern European parents, born in South Africa, to Great Britain, to the United States, to Singapore. As a final tribute to Sidney Brenner, we're going to have a song about Singapore, sung by the Velvet Fog, Mel Torme. Here is On a Little Street in Singapore. On a little street in Singapore We meet beside a lotus-covered dog a veil of moonlight on her lovely face 
I'll fail the hands that held me in embrace.